Welcome back, it's good to see you again. Make yourself comfortable and I will continue our story. Our heroes were still on the world of Ratzelwelt and had successfully retrieved the crescent blade of the dragon, which Grid used to slay a colossal red dragon that attacked them. Grid needed a few moments as he adjusted to the new draconic senses he gained, when part of the life spirit of the dragon engulfed him after he killed it. When he was done, Larilla commented about his now red skin, Grid you look like you have been sunbathing in the desert. Triumphant but tired, our heroes made their way back to the airship that brought them to the desert, and were relieved when Captain Kazmin smiled, good news we have inspected the whole airship, and the modifications we made for flying across the desert seem to be holding up quite well. The next morning the airship soars through the skies, and our heroes enjoy a well-earned break as the airship follows the coastline and arrives back in the town of Heartbreak a couple of days later. Barnabas upon hearing of our hero's success throws a celebratory party, and our heroes spend the evening drinking with their new friends. Larilla decides to take a walk around the town, and jumps with excitement when she sees that both pigs involved in the catching the greased pig she took part in when she first arrived are alive, and were not turned into the bacon sandwiches everyone seemed to be eating the next morning. The fighter is even more happy when the pig she chased does not run away this time, and lets her befriend it. Our heroes go to bed for the last time before they leave the world of Ratzelwell to continue their journey across the multiverse. The next morning as our heroes sit at a table and discuss their plans, Kayam approaches them, I have spoken with Barnabas, and we are both interested in the success of your mission. If you want me to aid you, I will continue traveling with you until this scorpion death god you spoke of is slain. Loading smiles, Kayam we would be honored to have a man of your abilities journey with us. The rest of our heroes agree with Loading, and Kayam sits beside them. Larilla asks the rest of our heroes, if our next destination is Athos what do we know about it? Arvain answers, from what I have heard it is an arid bleak desert world. A wasteland with a handful of scorched cities. It is a brutal land where life is grim and short. Loading adds, indeed I read about it once, and it is a place where water is more precious than gold and metals are in short supply. The only thing it has in abundance are heat and sun, blood and dust. Winter smiles, I heard the dominant species are humans. Loading adds, yes, but concerningly the likes of kobolds, ogres, trolls, orcs and gnomes are extinct. Larilla comments, extinct how? Loading shakes his head, I am unsure. However, Athos is a world where the use of arcane magic defiles the world, and terrible defilers of immense power called sorcerer kings rule in tyranny. So, speculation on my part, but tyrants of such power could be responsible for the extinction of entire races. Larilla a look of shock on her face adds, oh, and we are going there. Loading size, unfortunately it gets worse. There is a caste system on Athos with the sorcerer kings at the top, and slaves at the bottom. Education is forbidden to all but the highest castes. While our heroes sit in silence contemplating the world of Athos, Kurdic pulls his professor Orb Felix out and asks, Felix what can you tell us of the magic users on Athos? Felix replies, Athos is a world without deities though powerful sorcerer kings claim to be gods. Grid asks, this place you mentioned water being more valuable than gold. Are we taking some water? Kurdic can you fill a demiplane with water? Kurdic nods, we could take some barrels of water as they may prove useful. After doing some calculations, a demiplane could hold around 200 barrels with some room spare for a little food. Our heroes buy 200 barrels and hire some of the Heartbreak Guild initiates to help use the river to fill them and put them in one of Kurdic's demiplanes. When they are done, all our heroes also fill a couple of water skins each for easy access to water upon arrival. Greed and Larilla go to a local alchemist called Valen. After seeing what the alchemist has for sale, Grid buys a couple of his supreme special brew healing potions that have an unknown secondary effect when drunk. Larilla buys some hair dye to make her hair look more normal, hoping she can look like a child and not a member of an extinct race. Before departing loading comments, we have just spent a short time in a desert, and who knows how much worse and how long we will be on a world, that is essentially all desert by the accounts I have read. I think we should dress appropriately. Winter adds, I think we should do what we can to disguise any metal, if metal is rare, carrying something made of it may attract unwanted attention. 
Our heroes agree, and they all change out of their armor and clothing, and into clothes made of light thin materials to protect them from the sun and to help keep them cool. All the clothing and armor no longer been worn, is put into a bag of holding and our heroes are ready to depart. Our heroes stand in a circle and hold hands, and winter casts a spell, transporting them to a sunburnt land forsaken by the gods, water, and hope. They had arrived on Athos. After only a few moments the day's heat in the desert began to feel uncomfortable, and our heroes were relieved they had dressed appropriately, and that there was a large settlement not too far from them to the north. As our heroes approach the city, they see that it is built against a huge rocky buff at the tip of a forest, and sits on a reservoir of water. Before getting too close to the city Kurdic says, I am worried about this defilement you mentioned. I need to change my appearance so let's see what happens. The warlock casts a disguise self-spell, and as he does so he feels part of his life force drain and comments, this is not good, we may have problems casting arcane spells. Hopefully the light drain on my life force is what happens for each spell cast, but I have a feeling more powerful spells may drain more life force, so we should be very careful. The rest of the arcane casters in the group, Arvain, Winter and Loading, all sigh realizing this trip is not going to be as fun as the last one. As our heroes continue towards the city, they can see it is surrounded by a large thick wall and a handful of travelers are queuing at a large open gate. When our heroes join the small queue to enter the city, they notice that the travelers are paying for entry using little bits of ceramic. Loading attracts the attention of a man heading towards a nearby slum of tents, and when the man approaches the bard asks him, are you interested in buying something from us? When the man nods, Larilla knowing metal is precious on this world holds a handful of cogs towards the man. The traveler looks at the metal cogs, and Loading can see the man considers them valuable, but as they are in a form the man cannot make use of the bard is not surprised when the man says, I do not want them they have no value to me. Loading smiles, what is of value to you? The man points at one of the water skins Loading is carrying. Lorilla holds a water skin towards the man and Loading asks, what are you willing to pay for it? The man gently tosses Loading a pouch which the bard catches, when he looks inside it is full of ceramic bits. Loading looks at the man and in his most intimidating voice says, you better not be trying to rip me off. The man a note of concern on his face sighs, your water is worth more than my pouch, but it is all I have, and I have a thirst. Loading smiles, I will sell you the water for what you have, if you can tell me how much the entry to the city costs. The man smiles, it's five bits per person, however your slaves are not people, so therefore are not counted. Loading nods for Larilla to give the man the water skin, and when he has gone the bard says, so who wants to be a slave? Our heroes have a short discussion and decide that Grid, Larilla, Minsk, Lady Gondafrey, Kaim and Kurdic are going to be slaves, while Loading, Winter and Arvain will be the slave owners. When our heroes finally get to the gate, Loading motions for Larilla to pay, and when the fighter tries to short pay the guard, Loading backhands her across the back of the head as he shouts, stupid slave. Give him the full amount you dozy runt. Larilla gives the guard 15 bits, and he accepts them and lets our heroes pass. On his way past, Loading asks the guard, we have business with the sorcerer king, do you know where we could find him so I can open trade negotiations with him? The guard points to a large palace in the center of the city and loading nods, it's fairly obvious isn't it? As our heroes travel through the city, they see it is rife with poverty and slavery. Once they get in the more affluent parts, they begin to see merchants and other well-dressed people making purchases at market stalls with gold and silver coins. After spending a few minutes gathering information from the locals, our heroes find out that the Sorcerer King has not been seen in years, and rumors have begun to spread about his death. They also find out that the city's water belongs to the Sorcerer King, and only he or people on his behalf can sell it, and if our heroes want to make a business deal, they will need to visit his temple to see his representatives there. Our heroes find a nice inn in the nobles' district, where they can spend the night for ten gold pieces per person, and once shown to their room they are able to discuss their plans for the next day. After a long discussion, our heroes decide to all stay together in this strange place and all go to the temple. The next morning our heroes make their way to the temple of Nibane, and as they get closer to it, they notice that all the people wearing clothing indicating that they are part of the temple, are all women and either human or half-elf. 
When they arrive at the temple, Loading approaches one of the priestesses and says, We have business with the sorcerer King Nibane. We have traveled a long way to trade with him. The priestess replies curiously, What do you have to trade? Loading smiles, That is something we can only share with him, or his highest representative in this temple. The priestess, a greedy look in her eyes, says, For five hundred gold pieces, I will take you to the high priestess who can speak on behalf of the sorcerer king Nibane. Our heroes pay the priestess five hundred gold pieces, and she leads them to the other side of the temple where she says to them, Wait here. The priestess spends a few moments speaking with a woman who is clearly the high priestess. When the priestesses are done talking, the high priestess approaches our heroes, and as she walks towards them, Loading begins to feel her presence in his mind. The high priestess then says, What are you after? I will know if you lie. Winter answers, We are travelers from another world, and are after a weapon that the sorcerer king has that can slay a god, a threat to our world. The high priestess then asks, Why would my god let you have a weapon with the power to kill him? Winter replies, We already have two such weapons. If we meant him harm, we already have the means to attack him. The high priestess looks up into the air in communication with someone, and when her attention returns to our hero she says, My god will trade his god-slaying weapon for both of yours. Loading asks, Why would we trade our two weapons for your god's one? The high priestess replies, My god says his must be worth more than yours, for you to have traveled so far for it. Loading thinks for a moment before asking, Is there something else he would take, is there anything we can do for him? The high priestess answers, My god says as you are people who can travel between worlds, he would like you to enslave a world on his behalf, providing a limitless supply of slaves. He would deem that a value similar to his weapon. Winter asks, What power does your god have? The high priestess replies, He gave me and the other members of this temple our powers. Winter asks, What is your strongest power? In demonstration of her power, Winter suddenly feels the presence of the high priestess in her head. Moments later, the presence leaves and the high priestess smiles, My god gave me the power, that if I wanted to, I could make you do whatever I want. Winter turns into her umbral form and passes through those around her including the high priestess, and the sorceress smiles, We also have powers. The high priestess a smug look on her face says, As travelers from another world I expected no less, and you are strong. But my god is a god. Loading rubs his beard, we need time to consider your god's offer. We will return when we make our decision. Our heroes head back to the inn where they spent the night, and Arvain uses his powers of divination to see if it is possible to steal the weapon. The wizard believes it is still possible to steal the weapon, but it is going to be a lot more difficult, now that it is known that they are interested in it. Deciding they need to experiment more with the defilement that arcane magic causes before deciding on a plan, Kaim uses his key to cast a darkness spell and feels no negative effect. The Black Viper uses her ring to turn invisible and feels part of her life force drain. Loading sight, we need to know more about this world and the defilement that magic causes before we try to steal from a god. The rest of our heroes agree, and after taking a short rest to prepare themselves, they return to Waterdeep. Winter has a small rod attuned to Toril and uses it to plane shift most of our heroes to Waterdeep, and the sorceress feels quite a drain on her life force as a result. Arvain on the other hand needs to cast a wish spell to get to water deep, and the wizard has a large drain on his life force casting such a high level spell. And sorry but I will have to leave our story there for the moment, as I have another customer to serve. <laughs>